actually invoking are these things called services. And so each, in, each service uh, implements some sort of functionality to the outside world. So uh, you'll have services, well, here, I'll show you some. You can, you can programmatically look these up. So here's, here's a list. You don't need to be able to read this other than just to kind of vaguely show if you can see the colors sort of. One of the colors, that the gray on my screen, I don't know what it is over here. One of the colors is for what both of them are. Then there's the ones that are new in the 8974. And then there's the ones that went away in the 8960. Now, the only other thing I'll say about this. One is that these strings exist in the binary, which is kind of crazy, right? So like all this stuff's here. So it actually tells you what the names of all these services are. Um, uh, two, these can't be disabled at, or they are, excuse me, I don't know if they can or can't be. They are not disabled uh, at any sort of a high level. So any security relevant logic that's happening is all happening inside each one of those calls. So again, this decentralized sort of security where uh, they all have to do it right. So this is the base, base uh, service list that Qualcomm provides. And then OEMs can extend that further themselves. So um, the, the, the phones that aren't listed here uh, don't extend them, um, and then these ones do. So the Moto X has the one service that has like, uh, like 12 subcommands underneath that one. Uh, the Xperia Z is the same thing. It's got the S1 command, and then it has a, a number of ones underneath it. And then there's the HTC one that has the, these large, crazy ones. Um, and so, so I, I'll point this out. You can't, you can't see it on here, but we'll, we'll talk about it a bit later. But the, the HTC one is what we ended up uh, deciding to really focus on um, for this talk, because uh, as we were looking at these service names, uh, there's stuff that just jumps at it that you, you really have to go look at, right? Like uh, OEM read memory, write memory, um, mem copy, like stuff that you're like, really? That's amazing. Let's go find out how that works. And so to top all of that stuff off, right, um, it's basically one big box. And then you're stuffing people, you're stuffing code from Qualcomm, Discredix, every OEM, Netflix, whoever, inside that same box. And if any of them mess up, right, the whole thing falls over. And th that's a crazy requirement, right? I mean, you think about it conceptually or like at a design level, why you wouldn't want it to be implemented that way. Where um, if you know, somebody screws up uh, decompression of a video stream and during decryption, suddenly that means that like, your boot chain validity is no longer, you, like, you can't count on that? Like, that's crazy, right? Like, those things should not be Im impacting each other. So um, models for, models for uh, access to uh, or denying access to service availability, things like that, um, and memory accesses themselves, uh, those security models are fragile. They're, they're decentralized. They're done in lots of different ways. And the way that they're implemented on disk makes them f even more fragile. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit as we go through the exploitation example. Um, in most cases, a single memory write will just ruin the whole thing. right? And you combine that with the fact that the architecture is designed in such a way that it produces memory write bones, right? Like, you have this, this, this terrible scenario where you are incredibly vulnerable to a particular type of vuln, and then because of how it has to work, that vuln is going to be prevalent. It's, it's, uh, it's scary. So um, an example of that is uh, Dan Rosenberg's uh, Motorola X vuln that he uh, released in, like, 2011. Um, uh, we've got another uh, uh, HTC bug coming up that's, that's kind of similar to that one. Um, and all that, that was just a, a write zero. So he had the ability to write zero. He used that in the blog post um, and in the uh, unlock or whatever that was part of that to unset a global uh, variable that basically influenced the logic on whether or not you could unlock your phone or not. So he unset this variable and then called the unlock, and it said, hey, is this variable set? It said no, and it said cool, and it unlocked it. Um, there were a lot of other things you could do with that same bug, obviously. Uh, and so we'll, we'll talk through some of that here as well. So I've talked about sort of the, yeah, the, the architecture of uh, how, does, uh, how do the security models work internal once you get in there? What's the interface look like? How do you talk to it from outside? Uh, and now Charles is going to take over and talk about how we actually attack this stuff. OK. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so I'm going to go into some of the, uh, the, the fuzzing that we did against Trust Zone, and as well as the exploit that, that we put together for the HTC uh, XL. And along the way, I'm going to you know, go down some of the avenues where uh, we made mistakes, and so learning opportunities, and try to impart those so you kind of get a little thought into the thought process. So if you're ever looking at Trust Zone yourself, um, you're not going to do some of the uh, silly things uh, that we did. 
So that big uh, eyesore chart that Nathan had up here before that had all those function names, you know, he mentioned that those strings were inside trust zone. And uh, it, it's a little bit worse than that. Um, but I'm glad they were, because otherwise figuring out what everything did would have been a big you know, pain. So thank you, Qualcomm, and all the OEMs, but probably shouldn't do that. Um, so there's this big table inside trust zone that says, um, here's an SCM ID, and these IDs are the ways that you address. So when you want to make an SCM call, you have to have that ID, and if with that ID, you can make that uh, invocation. So you have an ID, ID 801, um, but you also have all this other inf information, including the name of the function, a uh, pointer to where the function's actually implemented in memory, and you also have information about what the function returns. Um, so there's a flag that says this is a function that's just going to return a status code, you have a function that says, oh, this is going to return um, a memory buffer. So that's really helpful with fuzzing, so you know what you're going to get back. Um, also helpful with fuzzing is there's information that says, this function takes in two parameters. No, well, that, that's better. I don't have to figure that out myself. Um, worse yet, this function takes in two parameters. The first parameter is of size 4, and the second parameter is also of size 4. So now you have like a really good profile of what this function does. Um, as well as how to invoke it so you can really target your fuzzer towards it. Um, and one of the tricks that uh, I learned when you're loading these things in IDA, this table really jumps out at you. You're scrolling through, you're scrolling through, you see this table. Um, and so in case you, you know, load it at the wrong address or you're not sure what address to load it at, um, you can find this table, look for the value 801, and then uh, see what the uh, pointer for, uh, just following that is pointing to, because it should be pointing to pill init image. If it's not, find pill init image string, rebase by the difference from where it's pointing to and where the string actually is, and uh, you're good to go. So this is the architecture for uh, the fuzzer that we implemented. It has uh, two components, a user space component um, that communicates over an OXL interface to a kernel module that we developed. Um, so the reason for this is obvious. Uh, the kernel module uh, is the only one that's allowed to speak to Trust Zone, and, but we want to interact with it from the user land because it's just easier. So the cool thing about this is the way the fuzzer works is the first thing it does is it asks the kernel module to say, hey, what APIs do you support? And the kernel module is like, I don't know what APIs I support, but lucky enough for us, Trust Zone does. So we actually asked Trust Zone for <laughs> you know, what service calls can we make? Um, and Trust Zone is, you know, nice and generous, and it gives back a big list of everything that it supports, which is great um, for us. So we can, you know, not have to, like, try to fuzz interfaces that aren't even there. Um, so once we have those, um, the fuzzer can then take that service ID that we know is inside Trust Zone. We can merge that with that metadata from the number of parameters and the size of parameters, and really kind of have nice targeted fuzzing um, for Trust Zone. So that did lead to a few problems, like inevitably you're dealing with a fuzzer, and uh, there's a couple issues. Um, it's probably not too uncommon. I mean, we've all been in those situations where you're fuzzing you know, some sort of black box. You don't have access to a debugger, and you know, same for Trust Zone. It's very difficult to debug what's going on. So, you know, you, you, you really want some, some, like if you're trying to trigger a write vulnerability, since that's more than likely what's going to occur, you want to write to an address that you can read back. And, you know, if the value changes over the course of that, that call, you know, there's, there's a good chance that you might have a write vulnerability there. Um, but again, that's, that's hard to do, and there's some fallacies in that logic that I'm going to go to a little bit later. So you end up having to do a lot of static reversing. Um, but it, it's not too terribly hard because just the nature of the beast, all the data is user provided. So you're not dealing with this complex, oh, this plus this from this register loaded over here is what I actually control. It's very straightforward to go after. Um, one of the other nice features, if you compile your own kernel, there's a TZ log variable that you can flip on, and then you can get the log messages from Trust Zone. Uh, fortunately, there's not a lot of great log messages there. so mileage may vary. Um, but perhaps the most useful thing when, when you're fuzzing this interface is, is the return values, because the way that Trust Zone is implemented, you know, if it fails, it's going to return negative 4 or negative 17 or negative 18. And, and this is pretty fantastic, because there's not, it's not going to return negative 4 from, you know, 
a dozen different places. It's negative 4 from one place, negative 17 from one place. So it's very easy to trace the code to see how deep you got if you're near the code that you, that you think you might have found a vulnerability. Um, but this is, this is the real gotcha when you're fuzzing trust zone. Um, a crash does not necessarily mean that there's a write vulnerability or there's a security vulnerability there. Um, just the nature of the way that trust zone is architected, you're passing memory addresses back and forth. And so there's a four um, byte parameter. You might pass a memory address and it might expect you know, a command ID. Might work, might not. But if it's expecting an address and you pass a command ID, you're going to trigger you know, maybe an invalid write to that address. But unfortunately, that address isn't in secure memory because you pass maybe one instead of um, a real address. So, you know, there's this kind of fallacy. It's like trust zone actually has a lot of checks in there that says, I'm okay to write anywhere so long as it's not this very narrow range. So just because you can make some code um, write to some place that you control doesn't necessarily mean that you have a vulnerability um, within trust zone. Um, but the cool thing about the fuzzer is it crashes trust zone a lot, like constantly. It, it actually is maybe the most crashable fuzzing interface that I've ever seen in my life. But again, you know, like not to beat on Qualcomm for this, because you're passing memory addresses back and forth, so any API that does that uh, is likely going to crash. Um, but this makes it really annoying for fuzzing, because you get so many results. Uh, it, it's not a great tool for, to really figure out uh, you know, where vulnerabilities might be. And um, kind of another gotcha, and I'm going to go with a bit more detail, but you know, one of the techniques that you know, I, I did to see if the memory write was there was I allocated an address in kernel memory. I passed that to trust zone, and trust zone wrote that value. And so you're like, OK, cool, I have a write vulnerability. Again, because of those memory checks that trust zone does to see if it's insecure versus secure memory, um, you can actually rely on that being a real vulnerability. All right, so now the fun stuff. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the vulnerability that we found and basically taking it to a fully functioning exploit for the HCC devices. Um, and again, I'm going to apologize for the people in the back. There's a lot of text from Ida here. Um, you are welcome to come up and take all these empty seats up here. Um, feel free. So let's get into it. So what I really wanted to present. Um, we had this big list of functions inside the HCC device, including memcopy. Awesome. You know, it, it may have been naive, but I really wanted to like walk up here and say, well, HCC implemented memcopy, and so I used it in own trust zone. Didn't really work out that way, but I wanted that to be. So shit. Um, so HCC actually does the, this nice thing that uh, you don't really see anywhere else in trust zone, that once a service is no longer um, going to be used, they'll disable it. And the way that they disable it is there's this uh, global bit mass that's initially set to all ones. And when you want to disable a service, you take the ID associated with the service you want to disable. So the ID here for memcopy is 20. And you flip the 20th bit and that bit mass to zero. And now you can no longer use the service. But this, this is our challenge now. Now there's a bit mask inside a trust zone memory that if we can somehow write Fs to it, or honestly, if we can write a one to the bit location for a really useful function, we might have something. So that's, that's the challenge that we're going to start working through here. So let's glancing around in trust zone. Um, we find this OEM discretics function. Um, and th there may be a vulnerability here. Um, give you a few seconds to find it. Um, all right, you should have found it, because I gave you five seconds. And uh, probably on the fifth line, you may notice that they're doing something not so great. Um, it's even worse if you realize that all of those parameters are attacker controlled. Yeah. <laughs> and for all of you that you know, kind of a little curious and didn't go, oh, um, you provide any address you want, secure memory, insecure memory, anything. And for that address, plus 16, it writes the value from a global flag there. Pretty bad. Not, not terrible. Depends what's at that global flag, you know, if we can influence. But this is the building block for um, the exploit moving forward. So, you know, at this point, 
it's like six in the morning, and I'm getting really frustrated. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, and I, I get all excited. I have this global bit mask that I want to clobber. I find a memory write vulnerability, put two and two together on um, the code that, that writes that. It's very simple. And I, I get all excited. It's, it's going to work. It's going to work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this. It's going to be trivial, but you know, fun to talk about. And it doesn't work. Um, so not only did I not enable memcopy, what happens to be at that flag is zero. So I actually ended up disabling every HTC service, including the one that I was using to exploit Tresone. Um, so I got kind of pissed and went to sleep. But um, we later verified that that flag actually always has the value of zero, and we, and we can't really influence it. So you can pretty much imagine that that write vulnerability is a write zero to any address that we want. OK. So then we have this, fu this function, um, OEM access item. And presumably, this is used to expose information that's stored in trust zone, but in a limited capacity um, back to you know, kernel space. And so you know, one, one potential use case would be, like trust zone would have like maybe a private key and a public key. You would want to keep the private key you know, within trust zone, but you're, you're willing to expose the private key if someone were to ask for it. So the way that this function works is you pass in an ID for the value that you want. You pass in your buffer, your buffer length, and it'll copy whatever um, item has that ID into your buffer. OK, that, that, that's, that's worth taking a look into. So at the top of the function, it does some little memory checks, but you know, whatever, let's go to the fun stuff. If you, know, you pass a value of, say, 37, it does this check. Is a global flag greater than 0? And so long as it's not greater than 0, it invokes a mem copy with a buffer you control and a length you control. OK. So you know, this is more exciting because there's actually other commands where the mem copies are the other way around. So you can actually you know, copy into trust zone and then copy from trust zone somewhere else from kind of like a two-stage thing. But so we tried this. It didn't work. Um, obviously, we got a negative feedback, which is kind of annoying. But fortunately, we have this really nice write zero <laughs> exploit. So we can just kind of clobber these flags and kind of bypass that check. That does, I don't know, something. Um, and so then we have this mem copy. And this was where we learned the hard-earned lesson that we can't necessarily rely that a value copied or written to insecure memory is the same as secure memory. So the way that we verified this is we passed in a buffer um, residing inside our kernel module. And then we got, we got a value back. So we triggered trust zone to write to our buffer. Um, get really kind of excited. And then we later look up. They're doing validation on the address. So just for context, uh, th it's checking this memory range, you know, 2A zeros to you know, whatever. And that's actually the memory that trust zone is loaded at. So what this check is really trying to do is say, you can copy data to or from anywhere, so long as it's not within trust zone. And of course, we're trying to copy this or, or clobber this global flag within trust zone. So again, kind of a, a dead end. But it's also kind of an interesting dead end. Um, because the way the validation works, and you know, it, it doesn't actually necessarily come across in this, but if you look at the assembly, um, what if the length that's A3 is really, really big? Uh, you end up bypassing this check. Um, ends up causing a crash, which, you know, again, to be expected. Um, but, but what if the address that you're trying to copy data is greater than this region? Um, so kind of an interesting tidbit. If it's greater than this region, it works fine. And so you might ask yourself, well, what's, what's after that end address for this region that you know, they're, they're trying to lock us out of? Uh, interesting enough, it's... Uh, it's also, it's also Trust Zone. Um, Discretix added so much source code to Trust Zone that it expanded Trust Zone beyond this region. So you can actually overwrite the secure memory of Discretix. Um, you, there's, that's where like, there's like hardware crypto APIs and DRM. Um, didn't really look into everything that's there. But now you can really muck with you know, things that might be beyond that length. And OK, 
that's cool enough. We're, we're modifying trust on memory, not exactly where we want to, but not bad. Uh, what if, about if we try to write to something a little bit earlier? Well, that works too. <laughs> you know, that's great. Um, but what, what, what's in memory before Trust Zone? Uh, there's a lot of really interesting things. You've got um, secure bootloaders, tons and tons of like, things that should not be exposed by Trust Zone. Um, so, and this is what Nathan was speaking in before. Um, this, is an, oh, this is a vendor implementation of you know, range checking. If you look at the equivalent co code in Qualcomm, they actually have, I, I, don't, I forget the exact number, but there's like 11 memory regions that they prohibit you from reading and writing from. And only one of those regions is being checked for here. So just by using um, this vendor code, you can actually read to and write from tons and tons of really secure memory on your device. Okay, so take it a step back. You know, our initial look, there's this mem copy, and wouldn't it be really cool to have mem copy? Um, you don't really need to see this, but this is the implementation of memcopy. It does, it says, is memcopy enabled? It does some range checking on the buffers that you provide to make sure that they're not pointing to bad memory. And then at the very bottom is the interesting part. At the very bottom, there's a call to memcopy on data that the attacker controls. We control all three parameters. There's a call that invalidates the, invalidates the data cache. You know, cool, that's convenient. It means I don't have to do it myself and then it returns success. So what can we do with this? This is, this, is, this is the code we want, but we can't get to it because we're providing these secure buffers. And it's at this moment that like Nathan and I just kind of stared at ourselves and like, we're idiots. <laughs> um, a quick assembly 101 for people who aren't too familiar with arm and thumb. Um, in Thumb, zero is compiled to this move instruction, which is a NOP. Um, and in ARM mode, it compiles to this AND EQ instruction, which is also a NOP. So if you have read-write executable memory, and you can write a zero, you can actually write NOPs and bypass balance checking, error handling, really anything. So now knowing that, let's look at the assembly for the mem copy. We enter the function, pushes some registers, everything we control, and in that little middle section, that's where it did all the validation. At the end of that, it calls mem copy, and validates our cache, returns success. So the obvious thing to do, since we're, I mean, again, this is, this is trust zone. It's dealing with physical memory. There's, there's no depth. Um, there's no ASLR. What we do is you just take everything in that middle and you knock it out. Should have thought of that before, but we're like we've been in this like we need to rob with this. There's like you don't you don't think about it anymore, but it's obvious, blatantly obvious, and like easy. And you know you look at exploit code, um, and it's you know sometimes hard to follow. But here's the code that um, exploits Trust Zone. And this, is, this code sets that global bit flag that you know, was initially, that had memcopy disabled, it sets it to Fs. And this was just kind of like a matter of pride because like, I wanted to get the damn thing to F. But we didn't need to because we have memcopy. And memcopy can read and write all secure memory. So did we really need to do this? No, but it's an example, right? So this is inside of uh, the kernel driver, and it allocates a buffer. It sets that buffer to all Fs, so well, that's going to be what we're going to copy over that bit mass to enable everything. Um, and then it makes the, it just writes zero all over all the error checking, so it just does, it nops all the error checking for memcopy. Um, and now that we've kind of neutered memcopy, um, we call the service, we call the memcopy trust zone because we know its ID. We give it the address of where that global bit mask is. We give it the address of our buffer of all Fs. We say copy four bytes of Fs and everything is unlocked. So there's the exploit, that's cool. Okay, let's put this in context. 
we have a secure platform. This is something we should trust. This should be this shouldn't be brittle. This should be pretty foolproof. It should take a concerted effort, a large amount of time to, to own this thing. Um, and it just like boggles my mind. Like, did, what vulnerability did we have? We have a really crappy, shitty write zero to some address. And using only that, we're able to, to read any secure memory address, any insecure memory address. We can write any secure memory, write any insecure memory address. We have these terrible primitives. And then using that, you know, you might have noticed we wrote NOPs. We're writing executable code into Trust Zone. So using only a write zero vulnerability, you get full read write access to secure memory. You get code execution within Trust Zone. Uh, it just blows my mind, but. <laughs> There you go. Um, trust zone. There be dragons. Uh, yeah. Thanks.